This week's horsepower begins with a treasure hunt. A special treasure buried somewhere in this salvage yard. No, it's not gold, but it is made with metal. Check this out, Joe, a two-door 66 New Yorker. It could be yours. Good shape. In our case, we're looking for precious metal out here. You see, we've gotten a lead that a candidate for our next project engine could be right out here. It's a very sought after, kind of rare engine from Ford's glory days of the muscle car. That's when many a muscle machine was powered by one of two 351 small blocks. One is the Cleveland, only made for five years, but legendary because of its amazing high compression heads. The other, the Windsor, is less exalted, but still a performance stalwart thanks to a long production run and tons of aftermarket parts. Actually, we're on the hunt for one of each. And our hunting ground is a place called CFC in Middle Tennessee, where if it's made of metal, it's made to reuse. Anything metal. The business started with aluminum can recycling and they still process those too. Why, there are several thousand in each of those blocks. But nowadays, you'll mostly notice a sea of vehicles people bring in for cash. If the car's damaged, the interior's tore up and there's no motor transmission, it's, it's gonna be scrapped. Like this truck, destined for downsizing in the crusher. That's the fate of about half the vehicles brought in, with the metal shipped to foundries around the nation. And the other vehicles? It's probably 60% of the cars we that we get are go to the pick and pull yard. Well, that's where this Mustang's headed, after the green treatment, that is, which involves removing all the fluids, fuel, oil, everything. A lot of parts off of this Mustang, yes, sir. The Mustang will join about 1,200 vehicles in the pick and pull yard, a great place to find good used parts on the cheap. A lot of parts they're looking for are parts you can't get at local parts houses or you have to go back back through the dealer. So they're, they're really happy to find those parts and not have to pay the premium prices. Customers plop down two bucks with part of the money going to charity. Then they're free to browse the ever-changing inventory for things to buy. Uh, we've had them come in and just and stay all day long from eight till closing. While there's no parts inventory, they do list the vehicles and where to find them. John saw several good prospects for the 351s on our wish list. We think our chances are better here because yards in the city tend to get picked over quicker. Something to keep in mind when you visit a location like this, once you've found what you're looking for, take a walk around the yard and look at some of the odd stuff. If you don't know what this is, it's a 51 Ford truck. One engine was popular back then, the old flathead. And this thing's original even down to the wire looms. Windsor's wound up in a lot of pickup trucks. Fortunately, this F-250 was no exception. There's nothing worse than being at a yard like this pulling apart and not having the right tool to finish the job. So we went ahead and laid out everything we like to bring so we know we're gonna get what we need out the first time. Now something else to keep in mind, certain yards don't allow certain tools like cutting torches, electric power tools, or jacks. So make sure you check that before you show up. Now one thing I like to bring no matter what part I'm pulling is a piece of cardboard to lay on. While Mike with his cardboard mat goes down under to free up the tranny, John gets busy on top, freeing up the engine. The salvage yard does provide a roll around engine hoist, which the guys put to work pulling the first of our two 351 finds. That's right, about 40 yards away was a once proud 71 Ford LTD land yacht with an apparently good 351 Cleveland between the fenders. All right, now here's a great sign. 351 Cleveland clearly on our identification tag, but that's not foolproof. What we need to do is look at the bell housing bolt pattern. If it's for a small block, it's a Cleveland. If it's for a big block, it's a modified series. And as far as the differences on the internals, we're gonna have to wait till we get back to the shop for that. We're back with both 351s we just hauled from the salvage yard, and during the teardown, you're going to see some of the key differences and similarities in the Windsor and the Cleveland here. But first, a few more clues as to which one you're looking at when you go browsing in the boneyard. First, the water neck, it goes right into the block on a Cleveland, but on the Windsor, the water neck goes right into the intake manifold. You'll find eight valve cover bolts on a Cleveland, but on the Windsor, there are only six. Finally, the Cleveland uses 14 millimeter spark plugs. The Windsor larger 5 8 inch plugs. 
We'll start the tear down by removing the valve covers first. Then the distributor hole down and distributors themselves. Big difference in distributors. Notice how the Windsor has a lot more length between the collar and the bottom of the gear drive and to the main body. Although I just noticed the Cleveland's gear is a lot thicker. Now this thing was set up for EFI, of course. The Cleveland's distributor points in vacuum advance for good old carburation. Next to come off with a little persuasion, the intake manifold. The Windsor is made of aluminum. The Cleveland, which needs a lot more persuasion, is made of cast iron. They actually don't share any similarities. Now the Windsor actually ran water through the intake, whereas the Cleveland never did. Now to keep from getting heat soaked, they actually ran a one-piece steel intake gasket with a valley tray built in. Now the Windsor's obviously set up for a multi-point fuel injection, whereas the Cleveland never was. It's a two-barrel carburetor setup. Now even with that, they're probably going to have a little bit better power potential looking at those big ports. Now one more comparison just because we can. We'll go ahead and check the weight differences. That's an extra six pounds. The two engines do share the same rocket arm design, non-adjustable pedestal mount. They're oil from the push rods, and check these out. Small splash shields bolted to the pedestal on the Cleveland, built into the rocker arm on the Windsor. Stock rocker ratio for the Windsor is 1.6, the Cleveland is 1.7. Under the rockers, things do change. Ford engineers designed the Cleveland head with the same bore spacing and head bolt configuration as the Windsor. It houses a canned valve design that allows larger valves to be used in the same four inch bore. This also made it possible to bolt Cleveland heads with light machine work to Windsor engines. In 1969, Ford did just that with the Boss 302. All Windsor engines use a two valve per cylinder design. The valves are in line, and Fords were noted 2V or 4V, and that was not the valves per cylinder, but the number of Venturi's in the carburetor. The port shape on the exhaust and intake runners is rectangular. They measure one inch by one and a quarter on the exhaust, and one inch by one eight fifty tall on the intake. In 95, this Windsor made 210 horsepower. This Cleveland has 2V heads, which have oval exhaust runners measuring inch 840 by inch 380. The intake runners are oval as well, measuring 2020 an inch 650. In 72, the Cleveland made 248 horsepower. Back to the Windsor heads. Now, our exhaust came in at inch 450 and our intakes came in at inch 780. And we've also CC'd one of our combustion chambers at 61 cc's. Our Clevelands are clearly larger with a 204 intake valve and an inch 650 exhaust valve diameter. Now, let's measure their combustion chambers. Start out by greasing the head to seal up the CC plate. Next, we can fill the beaker with alcohol and align it with the hole in the plate. Now open the petcock and let the chamber fill with fluid, making sure all the air is out. This one has a 79.9 cc volume, making it a 1970 2V head. The pumps are very similar in shape and size. They do, however, have different bolt patterns. And this could be one reason this engine was in the salvage yard. All this silicone here no doubt could block water and cause a serious overheating issue. The balancers are next. Both engines are externally balanced, and that can be seen by the large counterweights on the back. The pans are both stamped steel. The Windsor has 22 fasteners securing it and a small front pan seal lip. The Cleveland has 20 fasteners and a large front pan seal lip. Using a wire brush, we're cleaning the casting number area of the block. Ours is a D2AE-CA. That lets us know it's a 72 to 74 Cobra jet block. Now ours has two bolt mains with provisions for the other two. Only the Q code engines came with four bolt mains. The Cleveland has the timing cover cast into the block. A metal plate houses the timing pointer and seals the oil pan and cranks now. Check how loose this Cleveland's chain is. This puts a new spin on the term variable cam timing. An eccentric on the camshaft spins to raise and lower the fuel pump lever. The block also has a provision for the fuel pump. Back on the Canadian, the Windsor uses an aluminum timing cover that also houses the timing pointer. No fuel pump either. It was designed for fuel injection and had an electric pump in the vehicle. The chain's very similar to the Cleveland. Both engines use a front mount wet sump pump they're secured by two bolts and are turned by a shaft that also rotates the distributor. Good start, but there's a lot more to come. 
off, that is, both engines. Crank her on up, buddy. After horsepower successful salvage yard search, we got two Ford 351. So far, the teardowns tell us both the Windsor and Cleveland are basically good stock cores. We'll start with the Cleveland now, which uses a cam plate to hold the camshaft in place. It's got hydraulic flat tappet lifters that align themselves. Some have mushroom faces. If forced out, they'll damage the lifter bores. We raised ours so they'll clear the cam lobes and let us remove the camshaft. Okay. Now we can push the lifters through the bores and into the crankcase. The Windsor uses a cam plate too. This setup is a hydraulic roller. The lifters are held in place with a lifter retainer and lifter guides, and they keep the orientation with the cam lobe correct. Here's the difference with the lifters tappet versus roller. However, they both share the same bore at 875 thousandths. Three eighths inch rod bolts hold the caps in place, and the Windsor's big end diameter is two 321 inches. The rod bearings show signs of excessive miles. The Cleveland also uses 3 8 inch rod bolts and has a smaller rod diameter on the big end of 2 311. It's been rode hard for a while, but it looks okay. This bearing has dark green coloration and several pitting spots. That's a sure sign of oil that has been diluted by fuel. The corrosion it causes can also pit the crankshaft. The Windsor's rods are a factory forging that measure 5'9", 56 inches. Their pistons are a hyperutectic design with a dish and compression ratio is 9.1 to 1 with a 63cc combustion chamber. Now the Cleveland Cousins rods are also a factory forging but shorter at 5778. Their pistons are a cast design also with a dish and compression ratio with the 2V head is 7.9 to 1. All Windsors have two bolt mains. Its crankshaft is a cast steel piece that's externally balanced. Our main bearing has even wear on 80% of it. A bad spot like this is called offside wear, an indication of a misaligned crank or bore. The main journal diameter is three inches. Our Cleveland's two bolt main caps can be removed first, followed by the cast crank, which sits in a 2749 main journal. Although smaller, they do not sacrifice any strength. Just like our rod bearings, these mains show the same signs of fuel diluting the oil. There you have it, two Ford relatives compared side by side. It was well worth the mess. Next step, short trips to local machine shops. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. More than a commercial break has passed. After two weeks of machining on our two 351s, our Cleveland's back for the first of two builds. The machine work was handled at a shop we visited back in the pre-dyno days of horsepower. About eight years ago, we went to Tommy's Auto Machine in Springfield, Tennessee to use their dyno to test a 347 stroker motor we had just built. In addition to the usual work, here's what else they did. To restrict the camshaft so the bottom end gets more oil, they installed a set of oil restrictors from Ford Racing in the two, three, four, and five mains. To restrict the top end from the lifters up to the valve train, these lifter bushings were installed. That allows you to true up the lifter bore clearances. With all that machine work and our parts combination, we're going to raise the compression ratio of the Cleveland from 7.9 to 1 to 10 to 1, and that ought to be good for about 400 horsepower on pump gas. That's twice the factory rating. Plus, we're going to dyno it with these two V heads that came with it, then swap them for some four V heads to see how they compare. Meanwhile, the build starts with this hydraulic roller from Kopf. It's a single pattern cam, which means intake and exhaust are equal. Lift is 566, duration of 50 thousandths is 224. We're using Clevite bearings we ordered from rockauto.com for this entire build. The factory cast cranks going back home it was ground 20 thousandths on the mains and rods, along with balancing and polishing. New ARP studs are going into the main caps for added insurance. And after torquing them down, we can check in play, and at 8 thousandths, we're right in the middle of where we need to be. 
Here's the original cam plate. Now here's the one we're going to be replacing with from Comp. Look at how far we've evolved. This one actually comes with a Torrington bearing to help against wear and rotate an assembly drag. It was made to work with their race-ready high-tech timing set, which comes with double chains, oversized rollers, and you can advance or retard it four degrees. Now for connecting rods, we actually kept the factory length, but upgraded to an H-beam Eagle design. Now for pistons, we went with a forged flat top with eyebrow release for the Cleveland cylinder heads, but the total seal rings top it off. Now for oil rings, we just went with a low tension set with a set of stainless scrapers. For our second compression ring, we went with a Napier design, which has got a funny looking seven cut out of it. Now for the top compression ring, we went with the gapless. Now it's the two piece design that when you put them together, will make big power. With the number one piston and rod installed, we can go ahead and check our cam. Then go ahead and install the rest of the rod and pistons. After installing a new timing cover, we can go to the bottom side and install a basic parts store oil pump and a pickup from Milodon made to match the sump depth of their seven quart street strip oil pan. The balancer is an SFI approved piece from Pioneer. Our head gaskets, like all the others, came from rockauto.com. These are fell pros with a compressed thickness of 40 thousandths. At the machine shop, our Cleveland heads were milled, fitted with new guide liners, beehive springs, retainers, and locks. They gave them screw-in studs and guide plates, plus a three-angle valve job for the new stock size Ferreira stainless valves. Now, this is going to be a great stopping point for me because I've got to go ahead and get a push rod order in before next week. That's when we're going to go ahead and finish off the Cleveland, get the Windsor done, which is getting a completely different makeover. Then I'll take both of them to the dyno room for an all-four shootout. We'll see you next week.